His firm has been featured on Fox News, CNBC, WJD, and The Daily News. If you go to our website, you can find important information on retirement planning. And we also have a YouTube channel where you can go and find important content on retirement planning as well. Please give a warm welcome to Alec Tuckman. I want to congratulate you on being here today. You guys have all taken the initiative rather than surfing online or watching television. You've empowered yourself essentially and, and taken on your own financial future. So for that, I commend you. Every one of the people here today has received uh, an invitation. That's how you knew about this event. And on that invitation, there was a number. The number was what the cost of not taking your RMD in a timely manner was. Do you guys remember what that percentage was? 50%. Very good. 50%. 5 0. It is the highest tax penalty in the IRS code. And all you have to do to become a member of the 50% club is nothing. It's not enough. Mm -hmm. In that case, do you think it's possible that? You've, I'm sure you've all heard that saying, what you don't know can't hurt you. Does that apply here? No. No, not at all. I want to throw some numbers at you, being a number-oriented guy. <clears throat> the IRS, my three favorite letters, as you can imagine, is something of a Fort Knox when it comes to secrecy in terms of what happens there. But recently, well, actually not too recently, back in 2010, there was a leak. And that leak was about the 2006-2007 tax year. And they revealed, by sheer accident, when they interviewed someone with the, in the higher-ups, the, um, someone who was the government, uh, higher-up in the government for compliance, there was a leak when they did an interview with this gentleman, and he revealed a, a very, very scary statistic. That statistic was how many people were trying to take or didn't take money out of their for RMDs, out of their IRA. Do you want to guess what that number was? Yes, for the 2006-2007 tax year, how many people were supposed to take their RMD and didn't? How many people got dinged? Must have been a lot. It was a lot. You want to guess? 250,000 people in America did not take their RMDs and got penalized for that 50% penalty. Now, as bad as that number is, think about this for a second. That was just the IRAs. That does include the 401ks, the 403bs, the simples, the SEPs, the 457s. So, do you think this is a little bit important? You should definitely pay attention to these, uh, the rules and regulations for taking your RMDs. Yeah. And again, I commend you all for being here for that very reason. I want to talk about the next hour required minimum distributions, RMDs, and you'll get the knowledge, the benefit of all my knowledge over these last couple of years. Furthermore, you can get the added benefit that most retirees so richly deserve, and that is the knowledge of how to gain an income stream for life. What is the number one fear that seniors have? It's not money. death. It's running out of money. Exactly, it's running out of income. Income is the outcome, without that income, we're just homeless people on the street. So for that reason, it's important that we know that we're allocated properly within our portfolio. And I gotta tell you, having seen, I don't know, probably hundreds if not thousands of people in a given year, year after year, the number one problem that people have that I found in their portfolios is not being properly allocated. It's not having invested your assets properly. And when I say properly, I'm not talking about small cap versus a large cap versus a mid cap stock. I'm talking about something very, very basic. If you didn't know, there are two ways to invest. There's investing for accumulation, and there's investing for distribution. Accumulation is growth oriented. Distribution is income oriented. And for accumulation, whether you realize it or not, for those of you who have 401ks, IRAs, 403Bs, you're just putting chunks of money away over time, and over decades, you're doing accumulation, a growth strategy. And that's right. You guys did a great job by doing that. But what you're gonna find out very quickly is that 
The strategy we use in our 20s, our 30s, our 40s, which is excellent for accumulation, can be downright deadly when you're looking at taking money out for distribution. There are two very, very ways of investing. And what pe most people don't understand, most retirees don't understand, is once you hit 50s, you're 50-ish, you have to understand you have to make a paradigm shift going from the A to the D, the accumulation to the distribution. That's usually the number one reason I see people outlive, well, they have more life than they do income. And that's what we're trying to avoid here today. Today we're going to learn five things. We're going to talk about why RMDs exist. What are they? How did they come about? Then we're going to talk about how they're intertwined with taxes. What are the effects and the implications as we look towards your taxation? Then we're going to talk about different strategies and how they reduce those taxes with RMDs. And then we're going to talk about asset allocation and how we should properly allocate our portfolio knowing we're going to have certain drawing these RMDs. Because everybody in here, I'm guessing, the reason you came today is because you probably have a retirement plan. And if you have an, R, an IRA, a 401k, a 403b, what have you, the government is going to force you to take money out of your retirement account whether you want to or not. Finally, we're going to talk about beneficiaries. And if you think what you don't know can't hurt you, what's worse is your beneficiaries and what they don't know. Does that sound like a good strategy, a good agenda for today? So I want to go ahead and draw your attention to the folder that everyone should have gotten. It should look something like this. And we're going to start with my business card. You'll get some information on our firm. You'll get a bio, a little bit about me and our company. And then you'll learn about RMDs with this outline. And I encourage you to write down your questions on this outline. Because there's such a massive amount of information today, we're trying to get through all of it as quickly as we can, I would encourage you to write down those questions on the outline. And you can follow on if I'm going too fast or too slow. Feel free to revert back to the outline at your discretion. But what I'd like you to do is write down your questions on the outline, hold your questions till the end, in which case we'll start our Q&A at that point. And I ask one small thing when we go through our Q&A, and that is that you ask questions that apply to the overall group here today. I'm only going to take general questions because it's just not fair to ask about your particular situation when other people are around. Now, for that reason, we are offering, I'm going to extend an offer, for you to join me in my office in Torrance. And what we're going to do today, I can only get you through so much information that you have to work with. But I encourage you to come in and take advantage of this complimentary meeting that we're going to have. And what we're going to do essentially is take the information, the textbook information, that we're going to learn here today, and then we're going to apply it to your particular station in your particular situation when you come in to talk to me in the office. Finally, I want to draw your attention to the feedback form. It should look a little like this. Now, the feedback form is important for several reasons. It's important to me because the result of the information you're going to learn here today has been based on previous attendees and their feedback. And the more information I get about things like what you like, what you don't like, uh, what you wanted me to focus more on versus other things that aren't as important, that's going to help me be an overall presenter and get the people that follow you, they're going to benefit from that feedback just like you're, going to benefit, you're benefiting from the feedback of people that were before you. Now, the feedback form is going to be important to you because you're going to communicate to me how, when you're able to meet with me when you come in to see me in the office. If you don't have your calendar, I know a lot of people are, may not have the calendar, maybe you weren't prepared, you're going to have the opportunity to check on the box at the bottom where it says, go ahead and call me within 24 hours, and either myself or Ashley will get back to you at that point. We'll schedule that meeting if you don't have your calendar anymore. If you do have your calendar here today, do extend the offer. Ashley does have my calendar available on her laptop. Uh, I encourage you to go ahead and set a meeting right here on the spot after our conversation today, in which case we can make it easier for everybody and I'll save Ashley one more call. Does that make sense? Is that clear? Okay, fantastic. So let's go ahead and jump right in and learn all about my favorite subject, RMDs. 
So before we get to the RMDs first, I just want to talk a little bit about me. I've been doing this for several years. My first job on Wall Street was in 1994. I worked in New York. Uh, I worked in the World Trade Center before it became fallen. And uh, since then, I have become a fiduciary advisor. Does anyone know the difference between a fiduciary advisor versus what's called a suitable? An advisor that adheres to a suitability standard. A suitable advisor. Does anyone know the difference? With a fiduciary, it is my obligation, by law, to put your needs before my own. And I have to give you advice that is justifiable to a judge and or an auditor versus a financial advisor who can do something that's just suitable. They can present, let's say, nine or ten ideas your way. And even though you guys he may present you with one that may be less appropriate or less beneficial, as long as he gives you several other appropriate recommendations, he can sell you whatever he wants. I am an advisor in the aspect that I like to educate. I like working with professionals and I like the fact that people, I like working with people who like working with professionals. And for that reason, at our firm, we're big believers in two things, education and transparency. But we want to make sure when we go over our strategy, when you come into the office, that you, we're not just going to shove you into a mutual fund and based on a simple question, what's your risk tolerance, A, B, C, or D. And based on those four options, they shove you in a fund and they move on to the next line. Trying to plan your financial future is way more complicated than that. We take time to get to know you as people. Yes, your risk tolerance is important, but we want to know things a little more personal. We want to find out what your risk tolerance is, what your liquidity requirements are. We want to find out how long did your parents live? Are they still alive? What about your grandparents? We want to find out what your goals are, what your purpose is for investing. Because the way you invest for retirement may be different, I think you would agree, than investing for, let's say, a lump sum purchase like a home. So for that reason, we want to get to know you and understand what your goals are. And that's one of the things that makes us different. And just as an FYI, being a, a fiduciary, we, our firm was randomly audited about two or three years ago, and we passed with flying colors. To my knowledge, I'd say about 10%, maybe less, are actually fiduciaries. So whether you work with me or somebody else, make sure you're working with a fiduciary. Furthermore, I have a designation, my CRC designation, Certified Retirement Counselor. And what that means is my focus of studies has been on retirement and retirement planning. So rather than doing a general uh, focus on anything under the sun, whether you're talking about uh, leasing a car, renting a car, or financing uh, an apartment complex, I solely have been studying retirement and retirement planning. A little bit about our firm, I want to encourage you to do some research on our firm. You'll see when you go on our website, uh, lots of great free material. I encourage you to, to take advantage of that material. Things like videos, uh, white paper, information on retirement, not just on RMDs, but things like social security, retirement planning, and the like. So we have a YouTube channel, check that out. Uh, definitely take advantage of the free, free content. All right, if we can all turn to page one in our outline, let's go ahead and jump right in. What are RMDs and why do they exist? Well, you're gonna learn very quickly that the government sees things very differently than we do. When you look at your IRA, your 401k, 403b, you see that as a result of your hard work. You exercise discipline for a very long time. Well, you could have gone out and bought the next shiny object, the next new car, the next new iPhone. You didn't. You exercise restraint and you put that money away in your retirement account. So while you may see that as your, your, uh, your hard work, your blood, sweat, and tears, and exercise and discipline, the government doesn't see it that way. How do you think the government sees it? The government sees it, yes, but at even more higher level, the government sees it as a loan. A loan. And I usually get looks when people yeah. say that. It should be the other way around. <laughs> right? You would think so. You would think so. The government sees things very differently. You see this as a result of your hard work, they see it as a loan. Whenever you take out a loan, what has to happen eventually? You have to pay it back. You have to pay it back. So if you have $100,000, for example, in your 401k, and 
How much of that did you save in taxes? How much of that could have been taxed but wasn't? If you're, let's say, in the 25% tax bracket. Well, $100,000 and 25% tax bracket, $25,000 is money that could have been taxed, but it wasn't. It was money that the IRS let you have, and they said, look, we're not going to take this right now. We're going to let you hold on to this money for the, for the interim, and we're going to give you a couple decades to work with it. We're going to let you grow the money. We'll have it grow with compounding interest. We'll let you invest the way you want to invest, whether you're a conservative investor or an aggressive investor. But whenever, again, you have to take out that loan, you have to pay it back. And by seven and a half, guess what time it is? Pay back. Time to pay the piper, exactly. And then it's time when the government requires you to take that money out, whether you want to or not. And that's why R&D is exist. So what age, well, I guess I said it, what age do we have to take out the R&Ds? When are you required to start taking those distributions from your accounts, whether you want to or not? Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Now, here's how it's broken down. Oh, and by the way, before I can tell you that information, right now, as we speak, there is legislation on the floor of Congress. It just passed the House of Representatives, where they may be pushing 70 and a half back to 72. So that would be a great thing in terms of being able to push that back a couple of years. Now the caveat to that is, and this is what really irks me, this is what Congress loves doing, while you're getting a benefit over here, there's a threat financially to you and your estate over here. While this, they may be pushing back the age two years over here, they're threatening to take away what's called a stretch IRA. Are you guys familiar with what stretch IRAs are? And we'll get to this later. In a nutshell, stretch IRA is not a product, more so is it is a strategy. In some cases, and you're going to learn this later, there are several ways to take an inherited IRA for your kids or your grandkids. One of those ways is you can extend it over their lifetime. That's now threatened, where instead of taking over their lifetime, where they may maximize that IRA and get significantly more money out of it, they're now threatening to restrict that to a 10-year period. Oh. In which case, the government would, government would have a huge windfall if that happened in the billions of dollars. <laughs> and talking yeah. about billions, can you imagine how much money they make on RMDs? We talked about you know, just the IRAs in one year. 250,000 people in America got dinned. Guess how much money do you think they make? Billions. 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 Billions of dollars with it. <coughs> so as you can imagine, again, they love, the IRS loves you not knowing this information. So it's a great thing that you guys came here today. So, okay, so seven and a half, that's the short answer. That's when you have to start taking RMDs. But the good news is, your first year you have the opportunity to extend that. So again, every year, and this is the process as a whole, at a very high level, here's how it works. When you turn seven and a half, you're going to look at December 31st of the preceding year. And you have this year, any time this year, when you can take the RMD. Now, your first year and your first year only, you can extend that into April 1st of the following year. So let's put that to some actual tangible results or numbers or some more tangible visual way to look at things. So here we are in 2019. You would look at December 31st of 2018 as your final balance on your account. So you have any time this year, because you, this is the year you're turning seven and a half, so any time this year, you can take the RMD. You can take it annually, monthly, quarterly, probably even weekly, probably daily if you want it. But as long as you take the full amount, then it's satisfied. And by the way, is there any penalty for taking more than your RMD? No. You can take as much as you want to. But understand, you will be looking at significantly more taxes depending on how much you take out. But this is just the minimum. Again, required means you have to take out the money. Minimum is the minimum amount, and then the distribution is what you're taking out. So 2018, December 31st, that's the balance. You can take that out at any time during the year, and then 
As long as it's satisfied at the end of the year, you're fine. But the first year, you have the option to extend that another like three months or so into the following year. Now, sometimes I mention April 1st, and that sticks in people's brain. They think, okay, you said April 1st, April 1st, I got it, I took a note, I got that down. Thanks, Alec, don't need any more time to leave. Boom, that's a trap, not so fast. Because when you take it out is a strategy, a tax strategy unto itself. For example, if you are a high earner and consistently making money in 2019, 2020, 2021, if you take out your, if you wait till April of next year, well, yes, you push back taking out that RMD, but then what happens? It's another new year. Then you have to take out a second RMD in the same year. What does that mean? That means you could be paying double in terms of your RMDs in terms of the taxes. Now, there could be some situations where if you're making a lot of money in one year versus not a lot of money in the other, yeah, maybe that'll work. But in some cases, if you're consistently making the same amount of money, if you're making good money in both years, it may make more sense to take it in different years, in 2020 and 2021. So again, it depends. If you back me in the corner, it's just a very specific personal thing. I can't make a gross generalization. It just depends on your situation. And if that's a question, write that down and come in and talk to me. We'll talk about strategy. Very, very important. Any questions about that? I know I said all the questions till the end, but yes. If you died at 71, you know, you just did that. You died at 71, you have no kids, yep. no beneficiary. Does the government just take all the money? So that's a good question. Do you have to take an RMD the year you die? Yes, you do. <laughs> you do. Do you guys are you guys Beatles fans? Yeah. yeah. Have you ever heard the song of the tax man? Is it yeah. the song tax man? Yeah. yeah. Tax your head, tax your feet, or something. Yeah. Mm. The government. What is two sure things in life? Mm. Death yeah. and taxes. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but the good news is, again, there's a strategy, and the way you take the money out for your RMDs, we can make it more palatable, shall we say? But if you didn't have kids, no beneficiary. It's if irrelevant. You just died. That money's gone to them. Yeah. RMDs just means you have to take the money out whether you want to or not. Yeah. They don't care whether you have kids or dogs. If you have zero beneficiaries, they don't care. If you die, they take it off. What's left? So, and there's, there's exceptions to that. But understand that the RMDs are just what the IRS is concerned about. They've been floating, like I said, this loan for a huge amount of time. And now it's time, they're, it's payback. They want that money so they can tax you on it, so they can have income for infrastructure, for hopefully good things. Hopefully it's not things that's wasted. Now the exception to this rule is, anyone know? And by the way, I love having a smaller crowd because we get more fun and be more interactive. It's more cozy, more informal. Now there is an exception. If you are still working at your place of employment with an employee-sponsored plan, an employee-sponsored plan meaning a 401k, a 403b, what have you, if you are still working at your employee or in your place of business and you're taking you're contributing to that 401k, you can push that back. You do not have to take your RMD that year as long as you're still working and you're still contributing. However, I can tell you there is a gentleman that came to see us because of this very thing, he became a client. He said, Look, I knew you could uh, you could postpone. But what I didn't know, I thought you could postpone for all your 401ks. <laughs> now, this gentleman in particular had three 401ks. One, he was still working at. Two, he had not rolled over. We'll talk about rollovers in a second. But he said, the reason he became a client is no one had told him. He thought that because he was still working, he could push back taking RMDs from all his 401ks. He didn't know it was just from where he was still working. What is our penalty for not taking your RMD each year? 50%. Imagine having two or three or four 401ks and not taking your RMDs. Wait a minute, is that 50% of the total amount that you have? That's correct. That's Meaning, the sure. total <laughs> amount, sure. the total amount of the RMD, the penalty of the RMD. So if, you have, if your RMDs, for example, you have, let's say you have a million dollars in your right. portfolio, then you're paying roughly around, say, $40,000 for your RMD. Okay. That's 50% of your RMD. 
Okay, thank you. Not every time. I am not so, the whole amount. Yeah. So again, that's $20,000. Yes. So we want to make sure that we keep that twenty grand in your pocket and right. not the IRS. Any questions about it? Again, if you have two or three IRAs, and again, a lot of you might be sitting here thinking, well, I only have one IRA. I've been in the same company my whole life. Well, understand that a lot of you have probably had several jobs over the course of your lifespan, and so be, you, know, you get caught in the rut of things, you don't roll it over. You, know, you may have four or five 401ks or a mix of 401ks and IRAs. Okay. So if that's the case, be very, very careful. And this is where it's going to get really complicated in a second. I'll walk you through the process. But again, we want to make sure you avoid this trap. Boom, one less trap we avoid. So there is a method to the madness. How much do you have to take out for your RMDs? Well, I'll give you a hint earlier. So what you're going to do is take the balance, as I mentioned before, on December 31st of your retirement account. And you put it through something called, let me see if I have it here. This is publication 590. This is what you're going to look at to figure out how much you have to take out for your RMDs. Now, this is going under the assumption you're either single or your spouse is less than 10 years difference in age. If you have different, more than 10 years difference in age, there's a different table. But for our purpose, I'm going under the assumption that everyone's within that realm. So, knowing that, this is going to be, generally speaking, the table you look at, publication 590. And as you can probably notice very quickly, as the, the uh, you see that you have the age, then you have the distribution period. That distribution we call the distribution period is known as the factor. As the factor gets lower and lower, again, the divisible amount, the amount you have to take out of your RMDs gets higher. For RMDs, it's higher and higher each year. So while you're looking at about 3.65% or so for your first year, that gets higher and higher. Like the first year will be 3.65%, the next year 3.75%, the next year 3.85%, until the time you're 90, you're taking out 10% for RMDs. So again, there's a sliding scale. Now the good news is, since I'm an optimist, I like to look on the right side of things, the IRS does give you time to take it out, right? They're giving you a very extended amount of time. They're not forcing you to take out one lump sum or cash in all at once. So we like that, or at least that's how it is for now. So for that reason, again, if you're looking in a, in a positive light, you're taking this in a graduated scale over time. So again, using $100,000 as an example, using roughly the, the factor of 27.4% uh, as a year, your life expectancy, you're looking at just under $3,700 as the amount you will need as your RMD. Now don't get confused here. That's not the taxable amount. That's the figure you have to put on your tax return that will essentially be taxable. It's just without whipping out a calculator, that doing the math, let's say you're in the, I don't know, 25% or 22%. Tax bracket, you're looking roughly about $800 as that taxable amount. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so if you could please turn to page two of your outline. Okay, here we go, another trap, boom. You'll see again, very quickly that the IRS has put up a very tall brick wall between the types of retirement accounts. The way it works is very different over here than over here. And well, you may think, okay, an IRA, a 401k, it's all the same. It's very, very different to the IRS. To you, you may think, okay, whether I take the money out here or here, it doesn't matter as long as I give, you, give up that 4% or around the 4%. That's fine. And from a tax perspective, it shouldn't matter. You know, 100 grand, for example, is 100 grand, whether you're taking out here or here. But to the IRS, they're very, very specific. So there are different rules depending on what kind of retirement account you have. For example, if you have a 401k, when you take out your RMDs, you have to take out from each individual account separately. You have to do the math differently than you're looking at, let's say, an IRA because a traditional IRA, they view it as very different. Now, if you have the IRAs, then you can, this is the good news, you have a lot more flexibility. You can do a mix and match. You can do all from the winner, all from the loser. You can do just an overall balance. You can take from only one or a mix of all of them. You have flexibility, we like that with traditional IRAs. Another reason you need to roll over your accounts. So again, looking at an IRA, let's say you have an IRA, if you have four or five IRAs, like I mentioned, and a lot of people do, if you have one that, in an IRA, if you have five IRAs, chances are one of those IRAs are not doing well. 
So you have the option to take from the loser, the dog of your accounts. Or in some cases, you know, people realize that we've had a great roaring market for 10 years. We've actually, if you didn't know, we've had one of the best roaring bull markets in stock market history. In the 200 years of the market, we've had nothing but up and up and up for the last almost 20 years. As we know, what goes up must come. Exactly, exactly. So in that case, maybe you want to take some of the chips, the winnings off the table and reinvest them so you're not only, your success in the market isn't predicated on the stock market. And don't think that you're only limited to the stock market, by the way, because there are a lot of other ways you can generate income besides the stock market. But again, you have the, whether you take from the, 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 uh, the winners or the losers in your IRA accounts, that's something we can sit down and talk about in, in the way it affects you in your particular situation. Okay, so and just to give you an, just an example here again, just to back this up, with a $200,000 account, you know, let's say you have $7,800 you have as your, uh, your RMD. Well, you can break that down in half, so you're roughly looking at about, you know, just under $4,000 over here and $4,000 over here. The way you're taking, again, from the 401ks over here is going to be very, very different than the IRAs. So just don't forget that. Very, very different strategy. Again, another way that they can get you a trap. Boom. So this is my dog, Teddy. Teddy, showing you guys how easy it is to roll over, right? <laughs> roll over your 401ks. So you have every reason in the world to roll over that 401k, the 403b, your employee-sponsored plans. And really, not a lot of reasons not to roll it over. I think you'll be hard-pressed to, you know, to find an advisor that doesn't encourage you to roll over your employee-sponsored plan to a traditional IRA for a lot of reasons. The biggest one being simplification and flexibility. Like we just pointed out, if you have a traditional IRA versus a 401k, there's a lot less room for mistakes. It's just more simple, more clean, it's just easier. That's number one. And number two. Number three, less fees. For those of you that look at your statements, you may see a 0.25 or 0.50 basis point in terms of your fees on your 401ks. And that's not a lot at all. But what you don't know, didn't we say what you don't know can hurt you? The way a 401k works in terms of the billing, they usually bill the overall pie. And that's gonna be about 2%, 2%. So while you might not see it on your statement, you're still being billed. Okay. So if, that, if you have less than 2%, that 2% is eating away your profitability of your 401k. So by knocking out that 4%, don't you think you'd be, oh, sorry, 4%, 2%, that was a little Freudian step for something later, but that 2% less, that means you can be making more money, that's more money in your pocket. So again, another reason you want to be able to do that role Again, you have less rules and restrictions. For most of the people going to 401k, in some cases, they might just show you in a target fund. Does anyone here have target funds? For those of you who don't know a target fund, you'll see it on, literally on the name of your, your asset, your account. They'll say something like uh, Vanguard 2050 fund. Well, that just means that they're, they're anticipating you're going to need that money about 2050. And without getting into the minutia, there's a go to fund, a go through fund. But really, at 2050 is when you start pulling out the money. Well, that's fine, but what happens if the market's down and you don't need the money? So there are a lot of, you know, you were forced into that because it's a target fund. You weren't even given a choice. Sometimes you're in an uh, employee-sponsored plan where you were given a choice, and you've, bless you, anywhere from one to maybe 15 different opportunities. But then, what if you don't have a background in finance? How did most of you guys put, pick, the asset, act, pick the assets contained within your 401k? And if you didn't already know, a 401k, a 403b, a mutual fund, those are just boxes. And you just have to put assets in the box. And those assets can be stocks, bonds, cash, even money markets. So for most of us, I'm not going to put anyone on the spot, but for most of us, you know, we may lean over to someone in the cubicle next to us and say, hey, what did you do for your 401k? <laughs> or maybe we asked our spouse. Or maybe we have a, uh, a friend that has had a 401k for a while. But rarely are those people that give you advice, financial advisors. In some cases, that a financial advisor may have been on the premises, and maybe they said, oh, mutual fund, just put in a mutual fund, you'll be fine. 
And that's fine when you're 20, when you're 30 years old, when you're 40 years old, that's great. Because what you're doing is essentially a strategy called DCA, dollar cost averaging. And what you're doing is you're putting the same chunk of money away into that 401k every month, diligently, over decades. And what you're doing essentially, when the market goes down, you're still buying more shares, uh, the same amount of shares at a lower price, which overall drives the price down as a whole. And that's great. We like DCA as a strategy from 18 to 40. But again, people just think that um, you know, making the money is everything. Right? Money is a game, if you will. I hate to use the word money and game in the same sentence, but in a way it kind of is. Because it's not just about making the money. It's you have to first make that income. Then you have to invest it wisely for your future. And then you have to take it out. Taking it out is a whole other ballgame. It's a whole other strategy. Because how you take it out is going to make a world of difference. How you take it out and why you take it out. Because again, whether you have a Roth, or whether you have a retirement account, like a traditional IRA, different rules, different game. And why you take it out and how you take it out makes a very big difference in terms of how much money you can hold on to. So, are accumulation vehicles a good strategy for when you need to just take out the money? Do you see an accumulation strategy working when you need to go into the distribution phase of life? What do you guys think? No, not at all. Can you turn to page three, please? In your outline. So we're going to talk now about taxes. Are taxes ordinary income or capital gains? Anyone know? Ordinary income or capital gains? Ordinary. Very good. It's ordinary income. Do you get everyone to know what the difference is between ordinary income and capital gains and when you're taxed? It's a very different, very different. So, and the laws were just changed recently, if you didn't know, through the new tax bill. So there's capital gains, where if you're holding an asset, generally speaking, over a year and a day, you're taxed significantly less than if it's taxed as ordinary income, which is based on your, something called AGI, your, your adjusted gross income which just combines all your, your sources of income and your tax at a certain level. Mm -hmm. Now understand that taxes are a very, very uh, different, very sensitive personal thing. They're kind of like fingerprints and that you have different deductions, different uh, income sources, different types of income, different brackets. And this is something that really I've had to sit with you on an individual level to go into in more detail. However, there are some things, some red flags I've seen, some common mistakes, way too much, when people come in to see me. I just want to go over some basics about the tax, about the tax, um, about the tax code, so people understand and avoid some of these red flags. So the first thing I want to point out is lack of knowledge overall can cause people, can be detrimental, number one, it can cause people to be less aggressive. And there's nothing wrong with being more conservative or aggressive, but if you're going to be aggressive, I want you to be aggressive when it makes more sense. So what people think, and this is the biggest misconception that I see when people come in and talk to me, is that they think that, okay, if I enter a certain level, and by the way, if you didn't know, we're in what's called a progressive tax system, meaning not if you make, let's say, $160,000, not all $160,000 is taxed at that level. The way we're taxed out, it's progressive, meaning you're taxed for the first 20,000, well, just under $20,000 of this money is taxed differently than the next chunk of money, and so on. So, for example, if you're Bill Gates, using an example, uh, Bill Gates, his first you know, $19,050 is taxed differently at 10% and versus the next chunk of money, the next chunk of money based on how much he's making. And I'm willing to guess that Bill Gates is probably in the $600,000 plus tax bracket. So regardless of whether you're making $70,000 or whether you're making $600,000, that first $19,050 is taxed significantly less than the next chunk of money. Now, because of the misconceptions I see coming in, most some people think, and I've gotten this a lot, scary enough, is they think that if you make just a dollar too much, $166,000 in that next tax bracket versus $164,000, or $165,000, they think that the whole chunk of money is gonna be taxed at that rate, and that's simply not the case. It's just not how it works. 
that one extra dollar you make in that next tax bracket will be taxed at that 22% tax bracket, for example. So 22 cents in that case on that one dollar. So just understand, I don't, the reason I put this out is this encourages people to be more cautious or conservative if they don't know. Again, by not knowing it's detrimental. And all I'm saying is I want to, knowledge is power. I'm just here to empower you in this particular case because I want to make sure you don't make the same mistake. Uh, if you hold your questions, just take it. We'll get to it. Uh, and I think that's pretty much all I'm going to say on that on a very high level. So moving around, R and, and okay, so yeah, this is one of the other types. So your R and Ds, people understand they're going to get taxed because when you go to work, you, know, you wake up in the morning, you drive to work, you work, you see your, your, your taxes, you see that FICA where they take the money out, what have you. They know they're getting taxed on that money because they see that paycheck. And you usually get that paycheck stub or it's emailed to you, what have you. But when they take out R&Ds, they seem to forget, this is a big occurrence, that R&Ds are taxed as ordinary income. And they forget that in some cases, this could throw you into the next tax bracket. Boom, trap. And that's, you know, that's bad enough, but if you're not anticipating having that extra money to pay for taxes, the last thing I want you to do is have to pay on a graduating schedule, the IRS back, let's say five, six percent, on that money that you now owe them because you didn't anticipate. So it's important we take that into consideration when we look at RMDs. What's our next trap? Social Security. Boom. Another, another trap that people don't think about. The biggest head slapper that I usually get is that Social Security is taxed. A lot of people don't know that. And that ironically, not only was it taxed, it was taxed twice. And regardless of what side of the political aisle you're on, you can point to the other side. Because it was first taxed in right after Ray Reagan's era and Bush era, where they put a tax on it. And ironically, if you look back to 1935, when they first started Social Security, there was a pledge. FDR had a pledge to the American people. Guess what that pledge was? Social Security, Social Security will not be taxed. You're correct. Gold star. Mm -hmm. And guess what happens just in the 1980s? Just 50 years later or so. It was taxed. And it was taxed again in the 90s with Clinton. So again, you can point both sides to the other, to the other aisle, but the fact is you're still, you're still taxed. It was taxed at 50% initially, then another 85%. 85% based on how much you're making. How does that work? Well, it's based on how much you're making in terms of income. So if you're single and you're making under $25,000, you're fine. You're not going to be taxed. Like you will if you're over $25,000, in which case it's going to be taxed again at 50%. If you're married, that threshold is $32,000. If, however, you're making over $44,000 in a given year, if you're single or married, then you're looking at an 85% rate. Now, again, that's not the taxation. That's, you're going to multiply whatever the figure is in your, your Social Security by 0.85, and then that's what's going to go on your tax return. So it's tax. Does that make sense? That's not the taxable amount. But understand that you need to anticipate this when you start drawing RMDs. <coughs> Why? Because between maybe part-time income, maybe a pension, rental income, maybe Social Security, in some cases, adding on R&D doesn't just bump you up to the next bracket, but with something like you know federal and salt, state and local taxes, you're maybe possibly looking at 30, 40, in some cases even 50%, 50% in taxes. Mm -hmm. To me, that's almost socialism. Anyone here vote for a 50% tax bracket? I know I didn't. Mm -hmm. So understand that you have to anticipate this information, and that's why it's important that you talk to someone who's been through it hundreds if not thousands of times. If you can turn to page four, please. Okay. So this is where we really hunker down. This is where I'm most passionate and probably, I'd say, the biggest mistake I make when I talk with seniors. There are three, several ways you can invest. And at a very high level, we must invest, we must invest for purpose. There are three basic ways to invest. Anyone know what those three ways are? You can invest for a lump sum purchase, like a, a property. You can invest for your estate planning, for your beneficiaries, to create a legacy. Or number three, you can invest for income. And that's, I'm guessing, the majority of the people in this room today. Now understand that 
I always ask three questions when people come in to talk to me. And those three questions, usually the first one is, what kind of an investor are you? Are you an aggressive or conservative investor? And the reason I like to ask that question is, usually nine times out of 10, what people are in terms of who they are is not remotely how they're calibrated in their portfolios. And there's a gap there because the way they're investing isn't really in tune with who they are or what the goals are. That's the first red flag I usually see when I look at portfolios. As I mentioned before, there are two ways to invest, accumulation and distribution. On a very high level, it's almost like this is the big misconception that seniors have. They think you're supposed to have a nest egg that you build up your whole life. You're supposed to take a slice, a slice, a slice out of this big nest egg, like a piece of pizza, until what happens? Gone. Now, that's bad enough in a rising or a performing economy, a great economy, but what happens in a recession or a spiraling down economy? You're not taking one slice of the pie at a time, you're taking two or three slices each year to survive. You're having to sell shares to survive. And that can be catastrophic to your portfolio. Because when the market's down, you're, you know, it's not, you're taking two or three slices at a time because it's not what you originally were at. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And that can be extremely catastrophic. Now, understand that the instruments you're using, again, for the G, the growth, are very different than what you need to recalibrate to when you're, when you're facing distribution, your income. And you may think, okay, well, yeah, that's no problem, Alec. Like, I have my rental income, I got my pension, I'm fine. But when you do, uh, take into effect are things like inflation, things like medical costs, things like the standard of living. All of those things, if we think we're set, we have a nice you know, hunky-dory little portfolio. And by the way, if you're in a good position, we don't have to worry about taking the income for RMDs. That's great. But the government, it will force you to take that money whether you want to or not, which means you will be taxed on it. You have to take it out. Even if you reinvest it, you don't know where the market's going to be at that point. And that's what the real challenge is. So you may be at a simple level. I'm a simple guy. So you may at this point may be asking yourself, well, do I even need to be in that 401k where I'm not given a lot of opportunity, a lot of choices? Because once you do that rollover, you open yourself up to a world of opportunity versus that one or two or maybe five or six um, different opportunities you were locked into. And the government even knows this. That's why you probably are aware there's a penalty. You guys know what the penalty is for taking money out of your retirement accounts before age 59 and a half? It's 10%. And your tax is a taxable income, ordinary income. So when you're taking out the money, not only are you taxed as ordinary income, but you get that 10% penalty, you just kiss off to the, to the government for no real reason. And it's my job to make you money, not cost you money. So I'm very, very, and whenever I see that happen, when someone takes money out, I just like, cringe. And I have to give them that lecture because I, that's the last thing you want to do. But in terms of rolling over, it's a very simple idea. If you have to have this last throughout your retirement years, you have an option. If in option A, you have to sell shares to survive, or option B, you don't have to sell shares to survive. I'm a simple guy, I like to keep it simple in all ways. Which is the better way to go? If you don't have to sell shares, why? I remember when I was really young, the first time I ever heard about the income strategy, if you will, was before I even really knew much about anything. I was in, I was dating myself, but I was in probably grade school. And the movie, you know, remember Grease? Remember the movie Grease with John Travolta and the Newton John? When that came out, there was an interview with People Magazine or something. And they asked him, they were just doing random questions. They asked him, What are you doing if you don't get work for a while? And he said, Well, all my friends told me to invest and live on the interest. Even John Travolta, decades ago, knew this. He didn't know what it was called, he didn't know it was called an income strategy. But even John Travolta knew, his friends told him that if you invest the money and live on the interest, you don't sell shares to survive. That was a very good lesson, even as a young kid, I learned that. And to give you an example, we had someone come into our firm, and the first thing she did was she just broke down crying, just bawling. And we don't usually have that effect on people, you know? But um, we, we calmed her down, offered a Kleenex, and said, what's wrong? What, what's going on? And she said, my advisor did everything right. So that left us scratching our heads, and we said, what does that mean? Well, she said when she was 80 years old, she went to her advisor and she said, look, I'm single, 
no elderly beneficiaries, no kids, no extended family. And every one of my family had died before the age of 65. And I want to budget this out so I have about 10 years. So there she was, you know, very nice woman, athletic, reasonably healthy. She said, give me 10 years. And I think the advisor did something that most advisors would probably do. And they gave him, a, she said, I'll give you a buffer. We'll do 95. Well, there she was in our office at age 94 with a year left of income. And everything in that plan worked great except for one thing. What was that one thing? She didn't die. She was doing great. And while everyone else in her family had died prematurely for whatever reason, for variety of different health reasons, she was doing great. They say the kids born now, my kids, for example, they're born now. They're expected to live to age 100 as an average age for this newer generation. They're saying we're going to strain our social security now. Can you imagine what it's going to be like for my, my kids or even my grandkids? You guys don't have to worry about that as much, but knowing with that in mind, understand that you know life likes to throw us curveballs, and we never know when it's our time. So when you come in and talk to us, we always assume that our clients are going to live to 99, right? We we know 100 is what we expect, because we never ever want to have that same conversation. Now the good news is we did have a happy ending in that story. This isn't ideal, but we had her do a a, a, HILA, a, a reverse mortgage. Which again, we don't like doing generally, but again, we found a way to get her out of that mess. But we don't want that to have happen to any other clients. We don't like that. So again, learn from that, that tale. Okay. So if we're looking at this on a very high level, it's as comical as it sounds, it's sort of like having one chicken coop, being a chicken farmer. If you have one chicken coop to last the rest of your life, do you want to eat the chicken or the eggs? eggs? You want to eat the eggs, exactly. Because the chicken can keep laying over and over and over. So what we want to do is make sure you have that consistency in income. You never have to sell shares. And it's funny because we had someone come talk to us who said that, you know, based on that conversation I just had just a few minutes ago, when we talked about having to sell those shares, we had someone come in to talk to us who had a strong relationship a 20-year relationship with his advisor, and then he parted ways. When I asked him why, and this is that's very odd. Usually, people when you're you know in they have that long, strong, outstanding relationship with a 20-year advisor, they usually are live, born, and die with that advisor. When I asked them why they decided to, to jump ship, they said, "What you said just makes sense. It made sense." After he went to a seminar like this, and then he went back to his advisor and he said, okay, I'm coming up near my RMDs. What are we going to do? How am I going to take these RMDs out? And the advisor said what 90% of other advisors would say out there. He said, we're going to sell shares. Yep. And the gentleman said, well, I just knew that was the wrong answer. There's nothing wrong with that guy. He did a great job in the accumulation phase, but now it's time to transition. I'm at a different point in my life. And the instruments that work well in the 20s, 30s, 40s don't necessarily work well now. I and mean, I encourage you, how many people out there in the 401ks and the 403bs have actually done recalibration? I mean, actively, I'm not talking about buying or selling a share here and there. I'm not saying picking up a, you know, a couple of shares of Apple. I'm talking about major recalibrations. Over, I mean, think about it. Most people got into their retirement plans when they're 20 or 30 yeah. and haven't looked back since. And now they're 60 years old, 70 years old, they're still invested like a 20-year-old. Right. How does that make sense? So this gentleman said, look, it just I knew this was the wrong answer. And back then, I, I didn't, before, I didn't know what I didn't know. Now that I know what I don't know, or I, now that I know what I didn't know, I'm empowered by that information. And I knew that was the wrong answer. And that's why I had to change. I had to change. Well, we're great for 20 or 30 years. That's great. But now it's time to transition to a different phase of life. So you never have to worry about running out of income again. What a luxury that is. What a reassurance that is. How many people know what's happened in the market over the last 20 years? Anyone? Did anyone follow the market actively? Very briefly, if we look back at our stock market history, you guys may remember, the, anyone remember the 80s and 90s? Yeah. yeah. Great time. If you threw a stone, any monkey assumed could make you money. 
you put money in the market, you'd make some cash. It was a no-brainer. But that's changed over the last 20 years. Do anyone know why? How many drops have we had in the last 20 years? I'm talking about major drops. How many corrections have we had? Anyone know? Very good. Do you know what years? You learned for your second gold star. Obama thing about 2008 or so. Okay, 2008. And then there was one after 9-11. Uh, very good. Yeah, 2000. It was a slide from 2000 to 2002. Yeah. And you're right. That was. Do you know why? Do you remember why? Lack of faith, I guess. Uh, well, maybe. It was actually, it really was the tech crash. The I don't know if you guys know what the Nasdaq is. That's like newer companies and tech companies. It was almost wiped out after the did not call dot com bust. Then we had the second, which in 2008, you're right, 2000, starts slow, slowly sliding in 2007, it crashed in 2008, down in 2009, where we had the subprime meltdown. The subprime meltdown, where people were getting loans they couldn't afford, essentially. Oh, okay. And they couldn't pay them back, so things crashed. It's crazy. If you had put your money, let's say you had $1,000, you put that $1,000 in the year 2000, when did you make your money back? You want to guess what year? I'll give you a hint. It's past 2008, 2009. 2013. Now let's do the math. $1,000 gain going in at the year 2000. You don't make any money. You're just treading water until the year 2013. Let's pretend that was $1,000. Let's pretend you retired in the year 2000. How many years of sleepless nights did you have? Wondering where your next paycheck was going to come from. Yeah, you may have Social Security, but Social Security was never meant to be a primary source of income. That was always meant to be supplemental, right. quarter, third, maybe. So that's why a lot of seniors had to go back to work. And if you didn't have job skills at that point, or they were irrelevant, or if you've been downsized, or if you've been replaced by the internet, or robo, whatevers, then you had to flip burgers at McDonald's. You had to wait tables. And to be a greeter at Walmart. Mm -hmm. That's what we're trying to avoid. That is why being in a distribution mode is so key. Investing for income is so important. Okay, talking about the 80s, does anyone remember something called the rule of 4%? The rule of 4%. Does anyone know what that means? Does anyone remember that? Okay, so this is a many decades old rule. It was caught on in the 80s, where back then, the rule of thumb was, if you can generate 4% in your investments and live on the interest and dividends on those investments, 4% is what you essentially need, adjusting for inflation, to be able to survive your retirement years. Now think back about what happened in the 80s. Where were interest rates? Were they high or low? They were high. They were very high. I don't, do you guys remember 18% mortgage rates? Yeah. Do you remember 12% CDs? Yeah. I remember my father laughing his way from the bank, thinking what a steal he got when he refinanced the home for 12%. 12%. What is the average now? I don't know, three and a half, four percent So yeah, very, very different time. We can get that 4% very easily while investing in a growth strategy. But recently, Morningstar challenged that 4% rule, and it came up with a new rule in 2015. Do you want it? That was 2015, not to mention how much we've dropped since then. Guess what the new rule is? It's not 4%. What are most people pulling out of their portfolios these days? It's not 4% if you're in a growth strategy. Want to guess? 2.8%. 2.8%. A very far cry. Not quite 50%, uh, but a huge drop. However, if you're still investing for income, the 4% rule still applies, and you can still survive comfortably with your retirement. So now the question is, and you're probably asking yourself this, is it even worthwhile being in the market? Is it worthwhile being playing the market, being in stocks? Well, that's a worthwhile question. Write that down and we'll talk about that. And this is really gonna drive the point home. Uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, this is your picture, and it speaks volumes. This is trying to compare apples to apples. Are you guys ready? On the left, we have a growth portfolio. 